Hello and welcome to Stage Front Salon. The next is Entity Linking at Scale with Lucine. Thank you. Cool. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Right. Um, good afternoon, Berlin Buzzwords. Uh, it's been a great day so far. We've been talking about and hearing about search, vector search, scaling solar. So my talk is a little bit different, as in fact, we're going to talk about entity recognition and entity linking. And uh, we'll see how we do it at Signal AI. We will see also how Apache Lucene has been really, really important for us and a key component to achieve a great level of scalability. I want to kick off this talk by introducing a paradigm. Compute once, consume many. And we will see throughout the talk how this paradigm has been applied at Signal AI in different contexts, at a micro level and at a macro level. I'm Edo, I'm a head of technology at Signal AI. Signal AI is a London-based company, and as a business, we help other businesses and other companies in making better decisions. And we do that by allowing them to create complex analysis that will give them insights. And these analyses are derived by the world's content. So, in general, the way we do it is that we ingest, guess what, millions of unstructured content every day, from news to social media, from blogs, forums, regulatory sources, as well as podcasts and broadcasts, etc., etc. All of this content is uh, uh, going through a knowledge extraction platform where we extract various types of metadata in near real time. The enriched documents then lends into a bunch of different target systems like an object store, Elasticsearch, and a few others, which we can call logically our external intelligence graph. Zooming in, our knowledge extraction platform is composed of a variety of pipelines. Each pipeline is a collection of different services, and services um, can be logically grouped into what we call systems. Every system is responsible to extract a specific type of metadata. So in this case, we have sentiment system, the topic system, the entity system. Today, obviously, we talk about entity. So just to be on the same page, when, we, when I refer to entities, I talk about real world object. So person, organization, location, product, disease, etc., etc. At Signal AI, our entity system is by far the most sophisticated system that we have. We use a combination of deep learning model, and mach the traditional machine learning, as well as rules to extract different entities. Um, entities that we call semi-supervised are the ones that are being extracted by um, a deep learning model. So it's a single model that is able to identify a high number of entities, therefore give us a high coverage at the cost of a little bit of less, uh, less quality. Um, we, instead has, uh, we instead have, as I said, also different techniques like traditional machine learning and rules, which are much more curated and allow us to do fully supervised machine learning as well as like simple rule-based uh, identification. And it's going to be the focus is going to be primarily on the rules with a little bit of uh, uh, touch on the machine learning models. Because entities are so important for us, we have an internal operations, operation te team that is responsible to curate and actually check and, and support the training when needed of some of the machine learning model. So entities can be identified and can be effectively uh, linked uh, by using aliases. Aliases can be then transformed into rules whenever an alias is generally not ambiguous. So in this example, Manchester United FC is definitely a non-ambiguous alias that's going to point directly to the Manchester United Football Club. But we also have ambiguous aliases. And for those aliases, we need to not only identify the snippet of, of, of text from the content, but then we need to apply a binary classifier on top of it in order to disambiguate these ambiguous terms. So the core concept here is that for every entity that we have, we have many, many aliases. Back in 2019, Signal AI was going through an hypergrowth phase. And as a consequence of that, also, the amount of content that we had to, had to ingest was growing, as well as the amount of metadata that we had to extract. And uh, we observed two unexpected behavior. The first one is that during our real-time processing, there were some spikes. And when we overlaid these spikes to 
the incoming flow of content that, was, uh, that we were ingesting, we noticed a correlation between documents that were particularly long and some of the services, primarily our rule-based extraction si system, that, were, that, that was spiking whenever the content is, was very long. Now, another behavior, unexpected behavior, was more widespread throughout the entire processing pipeline. Our pipeline was taking longer and longer and longer. And again, our entity rule system was, or actually our entity rule service, was one of the services that was mostly affected. The reason of that is because as we were growing, more entities were being introduced, more aliases were being added. For, and for example, we were moving from about 500 aliases every, every month to about 1,000. As you can see from the graph, there is a quite of a, a, a steep curve, and it was not going to stop. So to kind of summarize, back in 2019, we were having our entity rule service. It was running about 10,000 rules. The P99 was around 10 seconds. Um, we were ingesting about 2 million documents a day. And the worst thing is that in order to cope with the load, we had to pretty much scale vertically, adding more CPU, and scale horizontally, adding more replicas. That caused an increase of cost. So just for the service, we were spending about $2,000 per month. And that was just to cope with the load. OK. So let me tell you how we apply this paradigm of compute once and consume many at a micro, micro level. So how do we scale the service? Before that, we have to understand a little bit more how the existing rule entity extraction was working. So the service was kind of straightforward. Um, it was taking a collection of aliases, transforming them in regular, extract, um, regular expression patterns, keeping them in memory. Then as documents were flowing in, these regular expressions were being applied. Right? Fairly straightforward, right? So what, what was going on? Let's see a little bit more what's going on with, with regular expression. So without going too much into the details and the guts of regex, a regular expression, when it, when it has a pattern, it has to go and scan our incoming document character by character by character. It has to scan the entire document. So we can say that as a runtime performance, our regex is linear with the length of the document. There is another aspect though. If that was localized with, a, with one regex and one document, we also have a lot of rules that we want to execute. And so as a service, the runtime performance is also linear to the number of rules that we have to execute. Okay, okay so if we sum these two, we can say the overall runtime performance to process a document is actually O M times N, because for every rule that we have to, that, that belongs to our collection M, we're gonna have to apply it to the document that has a length n. And that kind of is in line with the problem that we were experiencing. The more rules that we were adding, the more it was taking, that the service was taking, the more time the service was taking. And every time a document was much longer than our average, so I'm talking about from 10,000 characters to 100,000 characters, for example, well, that had an amplified effect causing these huge spikes. Okay, so let's look at the, at the problem from a slightly different angle. Like, the existing system does two main operations. Does a tokenization and a matching. And obviously, regex is doing this operation in place, these operations in place. So the, the tokenization is the simplest one, right? It's uh, just a character-based tokenization, character by character by character. Um, whereas the matching is, for every single rule, it has to find, as, the, as we are scrolling through the character, it has to find if the, the, the pattern is being, is being found or not. And by looking at these two, there's the matching part is something that we can't really escape. That is, every rule is different. So we can't really optimize there. Every rule has to be computed against our document. But at the same time, there is another one, which is the tokenization operation that is actually producing a lot of waste. We are scrolling through the same document over and over and over and over. Okay, so how can we break down the runtime performance? 
If we change our approach and we take a different perspective, we can maybe introduce a tokenization that tokenizes the documents only once, save these tokens into a temporary data structure, and at the point, use the temporary data structure to leverage all the different matching that we have to do. So this is a very simple thing. You're just splitting two different responsibilities, and we'll see, see a bit more, more, a bit more uh, later. And in the end, we are trading off some space complexity to achieve a better time complexity. As we are introducing a data structure in the middle, we are breaking the performance from being o, o, uh, m times n to be an OM plus ON. And we'll see how this is going to have incredible, incredible results. Now, um, we started thinking about solutions. And obviously, the first thing, the most naive solution that, that comes to mind is like, let's introduce something like a map, right? A map that allows you to just, you just tokenize very simply, store everything into a map, and then use that to do fast lookup. Well, that is great. But again, I said it's naive. And the reason why it's naive, because the problem that we have is not just finding single terms. All of a sudden, if you have your alias is composed of multiple tokens, then what do you do? You either save all the possible combination into a map, which clearly is not a good trade-off of space complexity, because it's going to grow quite a lot. Or you have to store this, some extra information, like offsets or in positions, somewhere else. Well. For some of you who are familiar with Lucene, let me introduce Apache Lucene. Apache Lucene does excellent tokenization. It provides great data structure, as well as has a great way of, of matching, a great, great way of running queries. A little, a little bit more about Lucene. Why did we chose Apache Lucene over, over building our own? Well, once again, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Lucene is a battle-tested information retrieval library. You've heard about it, and you will hear more and more some, uh, later tomorrow. It has a great and configurable framework to do tokenization. You can actually do whatever you want, because you will see later, you can create different steps to tokenize your text. It's using efficient data structures. So we have inverted index, uh, term vectors, and so on. And because of that, matching terms is blazing fast, and because of the advanced way of querying our data, we can do much more sophisticated query that are not just a term match, but for instance, you can do a phrase query that could solve the problem of having different aliases, uh, an alias with multiple tokens. So a high level view of Apache Lucene. A document comes in, it goes through an anal uh, um, a Lucene analyzer, which is responsible of doing some level of tokenization then all of that, all our terms and tokens, are being stored into our inverted indexes or term vectors. And then you can apply the matching with your incoming query. So let's look at, the, at this slide for a moment. And there is, I draw a dotted line for a reason. There is a first example of compute once and consume many. We are computing the index once, but we are consuming the index multiple times. How did we do it? So a little bit of like technical details of how did we implement this, this solution. So at index time, we created our own custom signal, uh, signal analyzer, which is really not that complicated. It's using a pattern tokenizer and then a bunch of filters, a truncate filter and a lowercase filter. The primary reason of using a pattern tokenizer over a standard tokenizer is simply because we wanted to apply a, a, a some sort of regex that would allow to preserve the same behavior that the original regular expression was having. And that is very important to us because it means that we are preserving the, 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 eventually the user experience. At query time instead, obviously, as you have a tiny index, you are executing your queries, but you don't really care about finding the document that is matching your query. What you care about is finding the piece of text that are matching your, uh, your, your aliases. And for that reason, we implemented a custom, a custom highlighter. The custom highlighter, primarily what it does, is that given one or multiple documents, it returns passages and, and the content, being the content, the full, the full text of our, of our document. And passages primarily contains a bunch of metadata, such as the number of matches of an alias, the offsets. And with some extra post-processing, 
uh, we can easily find the information that we need. And this is an example, an entity. There is a wiki title, which is our unique identifier, and there is an offset. That offset has been derived thanks, from, thanks to our, our um, signal, signal highlighter. And obviously, there is also the original surface form, so the original alias that we found in the text. Again, these are important to us because we needed those things later on in our, in, in our processing, as well as in order to display certain information in, in our web application. OK, so we saw how we use at index time an analyzer, and then like effectively at query time, you use a combination of query and highlighter. If we put all these pieces together, this is how the service kind of look like. So rules, or actually aliases, instead of being transformed into regular exception, uh, regular expression uh, patterns, are being transformed into Lucene queries, and they're kept in memory. A document comes in, and the Lucene index is being generated. And at that point, the very same Lucene index is being used in order to execute all the queries. Fairly straightforward, to be honest. But results have been quite, like, quite, quite interesting. And uh, we noticed that if before we had to run between 28 and 40 tasks in order to cope with the load, now everything was running on five tasks. And the P90 or P99 was around a second not 10 seconds. And you can see on the graph here that as soon as we've deployed this service, our overall performance improved dramatically from having lags, actually really bad lags of like 15, 30 minutes, to having some spikes caused by other services, but generally I mean, a, 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 a great reduction of our processing time. Okay, now, We've seen how we applied this compute once, consume many paradigm uh, at a micro level, so at a service level. But at Signal AI, we decided to use the very same paradigm at, to, to scale our entire architecture. And uh, in this way, we've been able to achieve like a high th throughput, both in real-time processing as well as in offline processing. Let me introduce three key, key principles that we are trying to kind of uh, use across our, our processing systems. Um, these three key, three key principles are, are abstract for a reason, and you will see why, because we can apply them in, in different contexts. And is single responsibility principle, like the, a parallelization concept, and batching. The single rep responsibility principle, probably many of you know, it, know, know or have heard about it, comes from the solid principles from object-oriented design and object-oriented programming. And the idea is that every class or a module or a function should have a single responsibility, like a single purpose. And probably about a year ago, there was a very interesting article that, was, that, that I've linked down here that talks about ideals principles. And these ideals principles are similar principles applied to microservices. And the single responsibility principle is one of them. And so the idea is that as a service, you can try to break the different responsibility, the different purpose that the service is doing into, diff into smaller services by paying a bit of price in space, because you're going to have to have an intermediate representation that has to be stored somewhere. The second principle is parallelization. Again, we heard about it over and over and over. And the key idea here, here, here is, again, very simple. The idea is that if you have a collection of services, and they don't have a data dependencies between each other, there's no real need to run them in sequence. As much as possible, you can change your design and start running them in parallel. And at that point, you're going to have a gain in your overall lag. Last but not least, batches. So we used to compute and extract metadata a document at a time. We realized that if we could pack together a bunch of documents in smaller reason or reasonably small batches, we could actually achieve quite uh, interesting things. Primarily by grouping documents into small batches, you get two things. You get less I.O., meaning that you have a reduced overall lag time because you have less serialization and deserialization, etc. And as a consequence of that, which is a good thing, is that your costs 
reduces, especially if you're running in the cloud, because you know, on S3, you pay per writes and, and reads. So if you are in batches, you're gonna spend less. You also have, with batches, great improvements in, in runtime. And this is because things like Lucene, whenever you're creating an index, you have to pay some cost in the data structures that you have to create. That is quite expensive if you are using a single document, but if you pack together a good enough number of documents, then like, there, there is a gain there. And like, the same concept of batches, which I'm not going to talk extensively, actually, I'm not going to talk too much about it today, but it's still very much valid, especially when you're doing uh, machine learning, because if you can compute instead of vector to matrix multiplication, you do matrix to matrix multiplication, your performances will benefit quite a lot. Okay, so if we take these three principles and we put them all together into the context of our rule-based entity extraction, this is roughly how it looks like. At the beginning of our processing system, we collect documents. We batch them in group of 50. 50 is just the number that we found that was good enough for us in terms of performance, as a trade of performance and costs. Um, these documents are being batched within, like, are being collected uh, with a different trigger point. So it could be there either within 50 documents as a number, or the, the maximum number of documents within two seconds, or the maximum number of documents that is reaching a global size. And this is in order to smooth uh, the um, batches, they may be bigger simply because there are a bunch of documents that have like 100,000 characters each. These, collect these batches are going through our processing pipeline. And in this case, thanks to the idea of single responsibility principle, we have a single service that takes the batch and create a Lucene index. At the point, we can use the Lucene index, obviously to do rare, like our rule-based entity extraction, right? As, as I mentioned before. But because we have also machine learning based models to extract entities. And because we need an alias, which is, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have ambiguous aliases that, have, that then later on need a machine learning. Well, you still need to have to find them. You still need to identify them. And you can use the exact same technology because in the end you're identifying an alias. It doesn't matter if it's like an ambiguous alias or an ambiguous alias. So let's fast forward. 2019, 2022, this is just about rule entity extraction. Back then, as I said before, we had about 10,000 rules, 2 million documents, we were spending a fortune, the P99 was about 10 seconds. 2022, we are processing, when we are executing about 110,000 rules, and we've done some load tests, we believe we can support up to, up to 200,000 rules, after which performance starts to degrade, so we're gonna have to think about Alternative ways, like sharding, for example. We are processing over 5 million documents a day, and the cost from 2000 to $200 per month, that's quite considerable. The P99 reduced as well. Yes, it is around 8 seconds, so it's not the different from the previous one. But the difference is that it was 10 seconds for one document. This one is 8 seconds for 50 documents. So at the document level, we are actually processing each document in about 200 milliseconds. Obviously, we applied the same principle across the entire pipeline. As you can see here, the difference in lag. If before we have a lot of different spikes, we were easily going over 5 to 10 minutes multiple times. Now our P99 is between 30 to 40 seconds. There are always spikes, they are inevitable. And to be honest, in our context, it doesn't matter too much if a couple of documents are a little bit delayed. But results so far have been great. Okay, so we talked about how do we apply compute once, consume many at a micro level. We see how do we apply the same at a macro level in real time. Let's see. It's the same paradigm with the same principles, but applied, and actually the same players, but applied with a dif in a different landscape. And before digging in, I have to give you a little bit of an overview of the business problem that we have. So you know that entities are very important to us. We create entities every single day. And the problem that we have is that whenever you create an entity, rules, machine learning, it doesn't really matter, 
only new documents that are being that are incoming, so the real time that are, in, that, are, that are coming into the pipeline, are being annotated with these new entities. And as a consequence, the result is that when you search for a specific entities, you're going to only have results from the moment in time from when you've deployed the new entities. That's OK, but it's not great for our users, right? When we have 15 plus months of data, we want to make sure that they can see and compute analysis over the widest period of time we offer. So we need a cost-effective way to reprocess the historical, our historical data set to basically retro-tag our entities. The landscape is different, as I said before. The real-time processing has small, small volume of data. Five million documents a day is not too much. We have always fresh data. Documents are always different because we ingest them and they arrive in real time as soon as they are published. We can talk about low latency in our context between 30 to 30 to 60 seconds. And whenever, in the context of entities, we have to extract them all for every single document. In the world of offline processing, again, the dynamics are slightly different. We don't need to process 5 million documents a day. We need to take care of 2 plus billion documents and counting, because we want to go back with all our historical data set. We capped it at the moment where we could go back five, six years. Um, the data, though, is primarily, let's say, stale. And what I mean by stale is that once we've received it, it doesn't really change. Yes, there are some documents that are being updated, but in general terms, the data never changes. The latency is different as well. We don't have the real-time need. Documents are already old, so if, it takes, if, if we do updates on a daily basis, that's good enough for us. We can do it on an hourly basis if we want to. It's just a trade-off how much money you want to put and how frequent you want to run your services. And last but not least, we are not covering all the entities across our huge amount of data. We only have a few entities a day that we have to recompute. The three key principles are still valid. Single responsibility, parallelization, and batches. Now let's see how these three key principles have been applied in a slightly different way in offline processing. So the idea is that thanks to the the, the single responsibility principle, because we managed to split services in smaller components, at the point we can choose what needs a one-off computation and what instead needs an on-demand computation. And we'll see that in a minute. Batches, the concept is the same. And in fact, the system, they just handle a collection of documents. The difference, though, is that instead of processing 50 documents at a time, now we are talking about batches of 50,000 documents at a time. That's a good trade-off, as we have 2 billion documents. And again, because our services don't have data dependencies between each other, you can run, you can run an instance of any service, for instance, the, the, our, the, the generation of our index, as parallel as you can. So whenever we generate indexes, we may run 100 or 200 different instances at the same time. As an architecture or structure, this is how it works. The data is persisted in S3. We use different buckets. Each bucket has a slightly different type of representation. So you have our row documents. We have our indexes that, again, are computed. So a, a, a file that contains 50,000 documents in the documents bucket is going to be the same that contains our 50,000 documents as a Lucene index. And again, we compute also vectors ahead of time. So we're going to have the same file that is uh, 50,000 uh, vectors and embeddings, and on and on and on. And when I mention one-off computation, the idea is that some of the services, like the generation of an index, the generation of vectors, doesn't need to run over and over and over across the 2 billion documents. Once you've created an index, that's ready to go. You can reuse it over and over. Once again, compute once on the left, consume many on the right-hand side. The on-demand on computation is on-demand because the, your input are changing. Today, you're going to have to execute entity extraction on rule ABC. Tomorrow, you're going to have to, change to, to apply rule, rule entity extraction on DEF. So as the input is changing, that is the part that has to, to, to be executed on demand. So just the same example, but with, uh, with a little bit more details. Our index generator takes the documents every night and um, um, generate our indexes for that day only. All the previous day, index was already there. And 
sorry. Here we are talking about, as I mentioned before, between 100 and 200 different instances that are running at the same time. Every index takes about five minutes to be created. So overall, we can create indexes for the whole day in about five minutes. When we instead have to extract entities, once again, our rule entity extraction, which is exactly the same service that we are running in real time, is running with this other configuration as parallel as we can. So 10,000, 20,000 different tasks that are running in parallel, each of which is using one index, extracting the entities, if any, creating some mutation, then then eventually will be indexed into our Elasticsearch. So in this case, obviously, the indexing up, the indexing up and completely at a separate stage. Everything is managed through Airflow, and the indexing is something that happens one off every night. We normally re-index between 90 and 100 million documents every night. So just to summarize our offline processing in the context of rule entity extraction, back in the days, pretty much it wasn't, it wasn't doable. We were doing it on demand, so if a business was asking and praying for a specific type of entity to be retrotagged, then we were doing it, but we were using this regular expression-based uh, solution, meaning that we had to go back and reprocess every single document that was taking forever. It could have taken multiple days. It was also expensive. In 2022, we can do this type of reprocessing at scale. We do that with Lucene, but again, obviously, we do that also for machine learning models for entities. We do the same for topics. In the end, the concepts are the same. Once you've computed your data and you have it there, it's just about executing your run, like your on-demand task uh, with, with uh, as many instances as you want. Um, the overall time it takes for rule entity extraction is about 15 minutes, between 7 and 15 minutes. It, it really varies. I don't really remember the reason why it may take some longer. It may take longer in some occasions. It's likely that the amount of content is different in an index than the other. But overall, 15 minutes is good enough, right? Okay. So key takeaways. Consume one, um, compute once, consume many. It's a great paradigm, paradigm uh, which allows, allowed us to achieve incredible results. You can apply it at micro level, at a macro level. It requires a deliberate decision. So it, it's not a solution that fits all. Like it really varies depending on your business case. And finally, last but not least, Lucene. Lucene played a key role in this problem because thanks to Lucene, we've been able to achieve entity extraction at scale in real time as well as offline. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions, if you have yes, any. Yes, we do. Any questions? Thank you for the, the presentation. Um, I had a question about when you introduce Lucene, you talk about the tokenizer. Yep. And you talk about the um, uh, pattern tokenizer. Yep. And you say that you Im implement some of your rules in this token, and you use the pattern tokenizer because of it's based on the regexp. Yes. And uh, how can you run once the pattern tokenizer and have different rules after that running uh, on, on that. How do you reflect your business rules in the pattern? So, so the, the pattern tokenizer allow us to transform our text to make sure that we can keep certain type of tokens. So for instance, if there is okay. um, a token with a dash at the beginning, mm. we want to exclude it. But if the dash is in the middle between two tokens, okay. we want to keep them together. Uh, but that is computed only once. So when the document okay. comes in... So the pattern is not really business rules, it's just... Uh, okay. No, no, no. So that, that it just okay. com does a first level of transformation. Let's, let's call it a normalization, right? Okay. It's just normalizing in, in the format that we want. And because we do it at that level, and obviously at query time, our queries are using the same analyzer. Mm -hmm. So then you are, you are getting a common ground and the query it becomes okay. crazy fast. Okay. Thank you. And if I can have a second question. Sure. Uh, in the, uh, on the beginning on your architecture, you showed us uh, that you use Elasticsearch. Yes. Is there any relationship between this Lucene we talk about here and Elasticsearch, which is using Lucene also? No, no. At the moment, no. At the moment, like the fact that we are using Lucene for this specific problem, 
is because we realized that it was like the perfect fit, right? It was, it was just doing tokenization, the, a good data structure and matching. But it's completely separate from the Elasticsearch cluster that we have, which contains a completely different type of, uh, a different shape of the same documents, because obviously contains content, title, entities, topics, and many other type of metadata. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. No, I have uh, other questions, but... Uh, Any time. With, with the beer. Any more questions? Yep. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, can you always apply the rules that you write now to, uh, to identify entities back in time? Or they, become, they can become invalid and may, may you generate wrong data? May you extract uh, wrong entities? Is that a problem that occurred to you? So are you saying, in case you have a rule, that may... So I'm, I may write a rule about uh, the Olympics in 2024, which uh, may, uh, if I apply it back to data from 1994, may actually generate from wrong matches. Is that something? Uh, that absolutely. So the, the key problem there is that how you define the rules. If you define a rule that is, could be ambiguous enough, that you're going to get into a problem where your rule, instead of having a good level of accuracy, is going to bring a lot of noise. And that is where you want to have a rule that just identifies the alias in your text, and then you may want to have a different machine learning model or multiple machine learning model on top to do this dif different type of disambiguation. Um, if in the ca case of Olympics, a valid rule would be Olympics 2024, but if we just put Olympics, that would catch everything, right? So it would, it would catch any type of mention about Olympics and not just the one in 2024. So that's why we are using machine learning models at, like, as a like, simple binary classifier um, to solve the ambiguity problem for this type of aliases. We are running about 10,000 machine learning models in production whenever like, a document is coming in. A selection of them is going to be executed depending on the, the alias. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, did you run into any problems when you were dealing with languages that weren't English? Um, no. The premise is that we don't have this problem altogether as when we do entity extract, well, any type of extraction, we use English only. So if we have documents that are not uh, in the like English, English lang language originally, but all of this content is being translated into English, and then we apply any type of extraction from rules to machine learning for topic and entity, et cetera, on English content. For this reason, yes, you may have some cases, you may have some errors at times, but they're minimal and they're like, they are not, at the moment, they are not as impactful for our business. So we are not going to tackle at the moment. That's it. Thank you so much. We are hiring. So if you're interested. <laughs>